Well, hello. We are reading The Last Vampire Phantom. We d Yesterday, we just finished Red Dice. Now we are starting Phantom. Oh. Here we go. Okay. Interesting. Someone knocks the door of the Las, a Las Vegas home where I stand. It is late evening. The living room is dimly lit. Four walls of blurred shadows. I don't know who this person is. For that matter, I'm not sure who I am. I have just awakened from a dead alchemist experiment. My mind is foggy and my nerves are shot. But before I embarked on the experiment only hours ago, I was a steel-willed vampire. The last vampire on earth. Now I fear and I hope that I may once again be human. That I may be a young woman named Alyssa, the humble offspring of a 5,000 year old monster called Sita. The person continues to knock. Oops. Open the door, he says impatiently. It's me. Who is me, I wonder? I do not recognize the voice. Although it does sound familiar. Yet I hesitate to obey, even to respond. Of those few I call friends, only Seymour Dorston is supposed to know I am in this Las Vegas home. My other friends, well, a couple recently perished in the Nevada desert in a nuclear blast. A lot has happened in the last few days, and most of it has been my doing. Sita, the person outside the door, says, I know you're in there. Curious, I think. He knows my ancient name. He even says it like he knows me. But why doesn't he tell me his name? I could ask him, but some emotion stops me. It is one I have seldom known in 5,000 years. Fear. I stare down at my hands. I tremble with fear. If I am human, I know. I am practically defenseless. That is why I do not want to open the door. I do not want to die before I have had a chance to taste mortality. Before I have had, I have had the opportunity to have a child. That is perhaps the primary reason I employed Arturo's alchemetic tools to reverse my vampirism to become a mother. Yet I am still not 100% sure the experiment has succeeded. I reach down with my nails on my right hand and pinch my left palm. The flesh breaks. There's a line of blood. I stare at it. The wound does not immediately heal. I must be human. Lord Krishna, save me. The knock stops. <laughs> The person outside takes a step back from the door. I hear his movement even with my mediocre human ears. He seems to chuckle to himself. I understand, Sita, he says. It's all right. I'll return soon. I hear him walk away. Only then do I realize I have been standing in the dark with my breath held almost collapsing with relief. I sag against the door and try to calm my thumping heart. I am both confused and exalted. I am human again, I whisper to myself. Tears roll over my face. I touch them with my quivering tongue. They are clear and salty, not dark and bloody.
another sign that I am human, moving slowly, striving to maintain my balance. I step to the living room couch and sit down. Looking around, I marvel at how blurred everything is and wonder if the experiment has damaged my eyesight. But then I realize I must be seeing things as a human sees, which means to see a little. Why? I can't even distinguish the grain in the wool panel on the far wall. Nor can I hear the voices of the people in the cars that pass outside. I am virtually blind and deaf. I am human. I repeat in wonder. Then I begin to laugh, to cry some more, and to wonder what the hell I'm going to do next. Always as a vampire, I could do anything I wished. Now I doubt if I will ever leave the house. I pick up the remote and turn on the TV. The news. They are talking about the hydrogen bomb that exploded in the desert the previous night. They say it destroyed a top secret military base. The wind was blowing away from Las Vegas to the fallout. Should be almost non-existent. They don't say anything about me. However, even though I was there and witnessed the whole thing, the experts wonder if it was an accident. They don't connect it to the mass police killings I committed in Los Angeles a few days earlier. They are not very imaginative, I think. They don't believe in vampires. Now, there are no more vampires to believe in. I beat you, Yaksha, I say aloud to my dead creator, the vampire who sucked my blood 5,000 years ago and replaced it with his own mysterious fluids. It took me a long time, but now I can go back to an ordinary life. Yet, my memories are not ordinary. My mind is not either. Although I suddenly realize I'm having trouble remembering many things that hours ago were clear. Has my identity changed with my body? What percentage of personal ego is constructed from memory? True, I still remember Krishna, but I can no longer see him in my mind as I could before. I forget even the blue of his eyes, the unfathomable blue as dear as the most polished star in the black heavens. The realization saddens me. My long life has been littered with pain, but also much joy. I do not want to be forgotten, especially by me. Joel, I whisper. Arturo? I will not forget them. Joel was an FBI agent, a friend I made into a vampire in order to save his life. An alteration that caused him to die from a nuclear bomb. And Arturo, another friend, a hybrid of humanity and vampires from the Middle Ages. My personal priest, my passionate lover, and the greatest alchemist in the history. It was Arturo who forced me to detonate the bomb and destroy him and Joel, but my love for him is still warm and near. I only wish he were with me now to see the what miracle his historic knowledge was wrought. But would the vampire blood obsessed Arturo have still loved my human body? Yes, dear Arturo, I believe so. I still believe in you. Then there was Ray. My Rama reincarnated. My memories of him will never fade. I swear even if my human brain eventually grows forgetful, my love for Ray is not a human 
or a vampire creation. It is beyond understanding, eternal, even though he himself is dead. Uh, kill, kill, trying to kill a demon, the malignant Eddie Fender. There are worse reasons to die, I suppose. I still remember more than a few of them. Yet at the moment, I do not want to dwell on the past. I just want to be human again and live. There comes another knock at the front door. I become very still. How quickly frightened a human can become. See there, this person's call. It's me, Seymour. Can I come in? This voice I definitely recognize. Standing with effort, I walk to the front door and undo the lock and chain. Seymour stands on the porch and stares at me. He wears the same thick glass and hopeless mismatched clothes of the high school nerd. I met in a stupid PE class only a few months before. His face changes as he studies me. His expression turns to one of alarm. He has trouble speaking. Oh. It worked, he gasps. I smile and open the door all the way. It worked. Now I'm like you. Now I'm free of the curse. Seymour shakes his head as he steps in, in the house, and I close the door. He liked me as a vampire, I know. He wanted me to make him a vampire, to poison him through the metamorphosis, an act that was strictly forbidden by Krishna 5,000 years ago. Now Seymour is upset, unable to sit. He paces in front of me. There's unashed tears in his eyes. Why did you do it, he demands. I didn't think you would really do it. I forced my smile wider and spread my arms. But you knew I would. And I want you to be happy for me. I gesture for him to come to me. Give me a hug. And this time, I won't be able to squeeze you to death. He hugs me, reluctantly. And as he does, so he finally does shed his tears. He has to turn away. He is having trouble breathing. Naturally, his reaction upsets me. It's gone, he says, to the far wall. What's gone? The magic is gone, I speak. I speak firmly. It's only Yaksha's blood that has been destroyed. Maybe you don't like that. Maybe your fantasies of being a vampire are ruined. But think of the world. It is safe now from this curse. And only you and I and how close it came to being to destroy by it. But Seymour shakes his head as he glances at me. I'm not worried about my own personal fantasies. Yeah, sure, I want to be a vampire. What 18-year-old wouldn't want to be one? But the magic is gone. You were that magic. My cheek twitches. His words wound me. I am still here. I am still Sita. But you are no longer Sita. The world needed her in order to be a place of mystery. Even before I met you, I knew you. You knew... You know I knew you. I wrote my stories late at night, and your darkness filled them. He hung his head. Now the world is empty. It's nothing. I approach and touch his arm. My feelings for you have not changed. Are they nothing? Good God, Seymour. You speak to me as if I were dead. He touches my hand, but now it's hard for him to look at me. Now you will die. All who are born die, I say, quoting Krishna. All who are dead will be reborn. It is the nature of things. He bites his lower lip and stares at the floor. That's easy to say. It's not easy to live through. 
When you met me, I had AIDS. My death was certain. It was all I could see. It was like a slow motion horror film that never ended. It was only your blood that saved me. He pauses. How many others could could it have saved? Now you sound like Arturo. He was a brilliant man. He was a dangerous man. Seymour shrugs. You always have an answer for everything. I can't talk to you. But you can. I'm a good listener. But you have to. You have to listen as well. You have to give me a chance to explain how I feel. I'm happy the experiment has succeeded. It means more to me than you can imagine. And I'm happy there's no going back. He catches my eye. Is that true? You know it's true. There is no more vampire blood anywhere. It's over. I squeeze his arm and pull him closer. <laughs> Let it be over. I need you now. You know more than I needed you before. I bury my face in his shoulder. You have to teach me how to be a nerd. My small jokes make him chuckle. Can we have sex now, he asks. I raise my head and plant a wet kiss on his cheek. Sure. When we're both a little older, I shake him, but not so hard as I used to. How dare you ask me a question like that? We haven't even been on a date yet. He tries hard to accept the loss of the world, of his world, the death of his magic. He forces a smile. There's a vampire movie in town. We could see it and eat popcorn and jeer and then have sex afterwards. He waits for an answer. It's what most nerd couples do every every Saturday evening. I suddenly remember it's taken me this long. There must be something wrong with my mind. I turn away and swear under my breath. Damn. What is it? Yes. You don't like popcorn? We have to get out of town. We have to leave now. Why? There was someone here a few minutes ago. A young man. He was knocking at the door. Ooh, who was it? Who was it? I don't know. I didn't even open the door. But this guy, he called me by my name. He called me Sita. He kept insisting I open the door. Why didn't you? Because I didn't know who he was. Because I'm human now. I pause and frown. His voice sounds familiar. I swear, I knew it. But I just can't place it. What makes you think he's dangerous? Do you have to ask that question? No one alive except you knows my name by the name Sita. I stop again. He said he would come back. He laughed as he said it, he sounded so sure of himself. What did he say? He called himself my darling. Seymour was thoughtful. Could a Turo have survived the blast? No. But he was a hybrid. Half human, half vampire. It's possible. Don't dismiss the possibility. I shake my head. Even Yaksha's Yaksha could not have survived that blast, but you did. I floated away at the last minute, you know. I told you. I just turned toward the kitchen, my car keys. The sooner we leave, the better. Seymour grasped my arm. I disagree. You have said there are no more vampires. What do we have to fear from this person? Better we stay and find out who he is, I consider. The government must have known Otura was using this house. Such records were probably kept somewhere else besides the army base I destroyed. The government might be watching this house now. But you said you knew this person. 
I'm not sure about that. There was something in his voice, though. What? Seymour demands when I don't finish. I strain to remember through my newfound human fog. His tone. It gave me a chill. Seymour acts like a wise guy. In the real world, not everybody who comes to the front door wants to kill you. Some guys just want to sell you a vacuum cleaner. I remain stubborn. We're getting out of here now. Grabbing the keys off the kitchen table, I peer out the back window and see nothing significant. In the distance, the lights of the strip comes alive, shimmer, color, colored beacons in the desert wasteland, a nuclear bomb just exploded, but human vice will not be postponed. Of course, the wind was blowing the other way. But I do not judge. I have always been a gambler. I understand better than most why the atomic dice did not betray the city of sin. Why the fallout fell the other way. Still, I swear again. Damn. I wish I had my old vision right now. Just for a minute. And I bet you're old hearing. Seymour comes up at my side and pats me on the back. You're going to make the same wish a lot of times for the next few days. Ooh. Now, we are in chapter two. I own a lot. I own houses all over the world. Some modest places to relax. When I enter a foreign country in search of fresh blood, others so extravagant one would think I was an Arabian princess. My home in Beverly Hills, where we drive after leaving Las Vegas, is one of those most opulent ones. As we enter the front door, Seymour stares in wonder. If we stay here, says, I have to get new clothes. You can have the clothes, but we're not staying. Ray's father knew about this house, so the government might as well. We're just here to get money. Credit cards, clothes, and fresh identification. Seymour is doubtful. The government knew you were at the compound. They think you died in the blast. They'll have to know for sure that I died. There, they were obsessed with blood, so they'll search every possible lead concerning me. I step to the window and peer outside. It is the middle of the night. They may be watching us now. Seymour shrugs. Are you going to get me fresh ID? I glance at him. You should go home. He shakes his head firmly. I'm not going to leave you. Forget it. I mean... You don't even know how to be human. I step past him. We can discuss this later. We don't want to be here a minute more than we have to be. In the basement of my Beverly Hills home, I pick up the things I mentioned to see more. I also take a 9mm Smith & Wesson equipped with a silencer and several several rounds of ammunition. My reflexes and vision are not what they used to be, but I believe I'm still an excellent shot. All my supplies I load into a large black leather suitcase. I'm surprised how much it weighs. As I carry it back upstairs, my physical weakness is disconcerting. I don't let Seymour see the gun. We leave Beverly Hills and drive toward Santa Monica. I let Seymour drive. The speed of the surrounding cars disturbs me. It is as if I am a young woman from 3000 BC who has been plucked from her slow-paced world and dumped into a dizzily fast 20th century. I tell myself I just need time 
to get used to it. My euphoria over being human remains, but the anxiety is there as well. Who was at the door? I, can, I can't imagine. Not even a single possibility comes to mind. But there was something about that voice. We check into a Sheridan Hotel by the beach. My name is Candace Hall. Seymour's just a friend helping me with my bags. I don't put his name down on the register. I will not stay. Candace Long. I have other ID. Then I can change my hairstyle and color to match, as well as other small features. Yet I feel safe as I close the door of the hotel room behind me. Since Las Vegas, I have kept an eye on the rearview mirror. I don't believe we've been followed. Seymour sets my bag on the, on the floor as I plop down on the bed and sigh. I haven't felt this exhausted in a long time, I say. Seymour sits beside me. We humans are always tired. I am going to enjoy being human. I don't care what you say. He stares at me in the dimly lit room. Sita. I close my eyes and yawn. Yes. I'm sorry what I said. If this makes you happy, then it makes me happy. Thank you. I just worry. You know. That there's no going back. I sit up and touch his leg. The decision would have been meaningless if I could have gone back. He understands my subtle meaning. You didn't do this because of what Krishna said to you about vampires, he asks. I nod. I think partly. I don't think Krishna approved of vampires. I think he just allowed me to live out of his deep compassion for all living things. Maybe there was another reason. Perhaps. I touch his face. Did I ever tell you how dear you are to me? He smiles. No. You were always too busy threatening to kill me. I feel a stab of pain. It is in my chest, where a short time ago a stake pierced my heart. For a moment, the area is raw with an agonizing burning, as if I am bleeding to death. But in a brief spasm, I draw in a shuddering breath and speak in a sad voice. I always kill the ones I love. He takes my hand. That was before. It can be different now that you are not a monster. I have to laugh. Although, it is still not easy to take a deep breath. Is that a line you use to get a girl to go to bed with you? He leans closer. I already have you in bed. I roll onto my side. I need to take a shower. We both need to rest. He draws back disappointed. You haven't changed that much. I stand and fluff up his hair, trying to cheer him up. But I have. I'm a 19-year-old girl again. You just forget about what monster teenage girls can be. He, he has suddenly moved. I never knew the exact age you were when Yaksha changed you. I pause and think of Rama, my long-dead husband, and Lalita, my daughter, uh, cremated 50 centuries ago in a place I was never to know. Yes, I say softly. I was almost 20 when Yaksha came for me. Oh, no. Now we have to stop. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. We will continue this tomorrow. The last vampire. This is the last, last vampire number four. And it is called Phantom. Now it's time for self-promotion time. If you like YA horror mystery adventures that are fast-paced and character-driven, you may enjoy Vampire Juice. 
Here is the book synopsis. Amanda and Sean stumble upon a mysterious can of juice while searching for Halloween costumes at a local store. Despite being kicked out by the sales group, they become obsessed with uncovering the truth behind the strange shrink. With the help from some local bullies, they sneak back into the store through a crypt in the graveyard only to find themselves in the midst of a spine-chilling adventure. Okay. So if you like Fear Street and the Lost Boys, you may like Vampire Troops. Okay. My link is in the bio. Thanks for watching, and tomorrow we will continue reading Phantom.